99% of developers don't get OAuth 2.0. Many can't even begin to explain the difference between OAuth 2.0 and JSON Web Tokens. Knowing the difference between OAuth 1.0 and OAuth 2.0 is table stakes, and it simply does not cut it anymore. And understanding basic token exchanges is the bare bones expectations in 2025 for every competent junior engineer. But the engineers who get ahead in this market, they understand the low level security flows like PKCE and token binding that make OAuth 2.0 the backbone of modern web security. If you don't know these concepts or are curious about them, then you should consider watching this video, where I'm going to break down exactly how OAuth 2.0 works, its critical flows, and the nifty details around JSON Web Tokens and PKCE. This is the knowledge that will make you a better engineer, so let's get started. Before we dive into today's topic, a quick thanks to Passbolt for sponsoring this video. Passbolt is an open source password and credential manager built specifically for teams and tech-driven organizations. It gives you team-level credential control, end-to-end -end encryption, self-hosting options, and full ownership of your data. So it aligns perfectly with our theme of secure delegated access. OAuth 2.0 or Open Authorization is an open standard for access delegation that allows applications to securely access resources on behalf of a user without directly handling their credentials. It's considered the backbone of secure authorization on the modern web, and it's used everywhere, from Google sign-in to GitHub integrations to APIs powering mobile apps. The key idea is to separate authentication, which verifies who you are, from authorization, which is what you're allowed to do. Instead of the user giving an app their username and password, OAuth allows them to grant limited access using tokens, which act as secure temporary credentials. These tokens represent delegated permissions and can be revoked or scoped precisely, improving security and control. At the center of OAuth are four roles, the resource owner, the client, the authorization server, and the resource server. The resource owner is typically the user whose data is being accessed, for example, you. The client is the application requesting access on behalf of the user, like Spotify wanting to read your playlists from your Google account. The authorization server is the system responsible for authenticating the user and issuing tokens, like Google's OAuth server. And finally, the resource server hosts the protected resources and validates access tokens before serving data. This division of responsibility is crucial because it allows apps to interact with APIs securely without ever handling the user's credentials directly. When a client app wants to access a user's protected resources, it starts by redirecting the user to the authorization server's authorization endpoint. Here, the user logs in, if not already, and approves the requested permissions known as scopes. And here's some example scopes. Read your contacts, modify your calendar, etc. Scopes are vital to OAuth because they limit what an app can do, reducing potential damage if a token is leaked. Once the user consents, the authorization server sends back an authorization grant to the client. This grant is a temporary credential the client can exchange for an access token at the token endpoint. And the access token is what the client actually uses to access protected resources from the resource server. In some flows, the authorization server may also issue a refresh token. This is a long-lived token that can be exchanged for new access tokens without requiring the user to log in again. And it's essential for maintaining sessions securely. There are several grant types or flows in OAuth 2.0, each suited for different scenarios. The most common is the authorization code flow, designed for confidential clients like web servers that can securely store secrets. Here, the client exchanges the authorization code for an access token using its client secret, ensuring tokens aren't exposed in the browser. For public clients, like single page or mobile apps, a variant called the authorization code flow with PKCE or proof key for code exchange adds protection against interception attacks. So PKCE replaces the client secret with a dynamically generated code challenge and verifier, preventing malicious apps from stealing the authorization code during redirection. Other flows include the client credentials flow used for server to server communication where no user is involved and the device code flow for devices with limited input capabilities like smart TVs. There's also the deprecated implicit flow that was once used for browser-based apps, but it's now discouraged due to token exposure risks. OAuth tokens themselves are usually JSON Web Tokens or JWTs. These are digitally signed, compact data structures that encode information like the issuer, the subject, expiry time, and granted scopes. A JSON Web Token consists of three parts. A header specifying the algorithm and token type, a payload with the claims, 
and a signature used to verify the integrity of the token. Since JSON web tokens are self-contained, resource servers can validate them without contacting the authorization server, and this improves performance. However, this also introduces considerations around token revocation and expiry, since once issued, JSON web tokens remain valid until they expire. This is why refresh tokens and short token lifetimes are used to balance convenience with security. Now here's where this ties perfectly into Passbolt. Because OAuth's philosophy of delegation without exposure is exactly how Passbolt approaches password and secret management. In OAuth, you're delegating access without sharing your user password. And Passbolt applies exactly that same principle, but to internal credentials, secrets, API keys, database passwords, everything your team uses. It's built for teams, not just individuals. You get granular sharing, role-based access so you can enforce the principle of least privilege, full audit logs, and you can host it either in the cloud or self-host behind your firewall, so your data stays where you trust it. Passbolt uses end-to-end -end encryption, private keys generated client-side, even phishing and brute force protections built in. So when your dev team is handling service account credentials, API tokens, and SSH keys, you're essentially doing the same tokenized access, don't share your password idea that OAuth preaches. Passbolt is the credential management side of that story. So when your team collaborates, Passbolt acts as the secure authorization server for your credentials. It lets you grant fine-grained access to just the right people or systems without exposing the master passwords themselves. You can integrate it with your CI-CD pipelines or cloud environments, and since it's open source, you retain full control over where and how it runs. And just like how OAuth tokens can be revoked at any time, Passbolt allows you to instantly revoke or rotate secrets without breaking workflows. In many ways, Passbolt is OAuth's spirit applied to human and infrastructure credentials, delegated access, scoped control, auditable actions, and zero trust by design. If you or your organization takes identity, access, and delegation seriously, you should check out Passbolt down below. Now back to the video. Another critical part of OAuth is the use of client registration and secrets. Before a client app can use OAuth, it must register with the authorization server and receive a unique client ID, and for confidential clients, a client secret. This ensures that only known, approved clients can request tokens. Combined with redirect URIs, this prevents redirect URI manipulation attacks where a malicious actor tries to intercept authorization codes or tokens by tampering with redirect endpoints. Authorization servers strictly validate these URIs and often require exact matches with registered ones. It's also important to understand that OAuth by itself does not handle authentication. It is purely an authorization framework. However, many services extend OAuth with Open ID Connect or OIDC, which adds an ID token, which is a special JSON web token containing user identity information and standardized endpoints for user info. This combination enables both authentication and authorization in one flow, allowing users to sign in with Google or sign in with Apple using OAuth infrastructure enhanced by OIDC. But now you might be curious, what is the difference between OAuth 1.0 and OAuth 2.0. OAuth 1.0 and OAuth 2.0 are both frameworks for delegated authorization, allowing third-party applications to access a user's data without sharing credentials. But despite the similar name, they're architecturally very different. OAuth 1.0 was built around cryptographic signatures and two-legged or three-legged flows. Every request in OAuth 1.0 had to be signed using HMAC SHA-1 or RSA SHA-1 with a combination of shared secrets, timestamps, and nonces. This design ensured strong request integrity. Even if someone intercepted the HTTP traffic, they couldn't reuse or forge the request without the proper key and signature. However, it came at the cost of very high complexity. Each client had to implement signature generation and verification correctly, and small differences in implementation often caused compatibility issues. OAuth 1.0 also relied very heavily on custom logic instead of standard HTTP features, making it very cumbersome for modern web and mobile apps. In contrast, OAuth 2.0 reimagined this framework entirely. It removed the requirement for cryptographic signatures and shifted security responsibilities to the underlying HTTPS transport layer. Instead of signing every request, OAuth 2.0 uses bearer tokens simple access tokens that grant permission as long as the connection remains secure. This made OAuth 2.0 vastly easier to implement across browsers, APIs, and mobile apps. Another major shift was that OAuth 2.0 became extensible and token-driven. It added features like scopes to limit access, refresh tokens to renew sessions, and token expiration policies to reduce exposure risk. All these concepts made OAuth 2.0 much more flexible and adaptable for modern cloud systems, though they also placed more security responsibility on developers and authorization servers. So unlike OAuth 1.0, which tightly enforced cryptographic structure, OAuth 2.0 gave implementers freedom. 
which could lead to misconfigurations or insecure defaults if not handled correctly. It relies on HTTPS, scoped tokens, and proper expiration to maintain security across distributed systems. What's common is that both versions aim to eliminate password sharing. While OAuth handles delegated access between apps, Passbolt manages delegation between people, team, and systems. It's the best open source password and secret manager built for devs, with end-to-end -end encryption, granular access control, and self-hosting options. Check out Passbolt down below. And if you want to learn how to build Docker, Redis, and compilers from scratch, I highly recommend you check out Codecrafters down below.